You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. What a beautiful day for horses in the morning. You are listening to the number one horse podcast in the world. Here's your entertaining look at the horse world and the people in it. I'm Julie Broadway, president at the American Horse Council, and you're listening to the special monthly episode of the American Horse Council's uh, Horses in the Morning on the Horse Radio Network for Tuesday, September 3rd, 2024. Good morning, horse world. It's time to hear from the American Horse Council in this monthly episode of Horses in the Morning. Thanks so much for tuning in. Again, I'm flying solo today, folks. Emily Stearns, who usually does the co-hosting with me, is away on a business trip, so you're stuck with little old me. And I'm so excited about our subject this morning. Grassroots advocacy is the key to successfully influencing legislative issues at the federal, state, and local level. Not to offend any of our listeners, but often people think, oh, I don't need to get involved. Somebody else is going to take care of that for me, when every voice actually needs to be heard. State horse councils are vital to making sure issues at the state and local level are in the best interest of the horse industry. And they also offer fun events that brings all aspects of the industry together. It's also a good time to mention that not every state has a horse council or not yet. We are hopeful. This could be the kick in the pants, as we like to say, that you need to get organized and to meet new horse friends in your state. And we're hoping that by the end of this episode, you'll be feeling the itch to get involved locally for the horse industry. Today's episode is brought to you by SmartPak. Our friends at SmartPak are on a mission, a mission to help support even more healthy horses and happy riders. That's why they carry everything you need from brands you know and love to SmartPak exclusive supplements like their full family of SmartFlex joint supplements to all the tack essentials you need for your horse. Plus, they stand by all their products with their 100% happiness guarantee. So visit SmartPack.com or find them on Instagram at SmartPack to discover how they can support your equestrian journey. So have a great ride. So you're sitting there wondering, well, what is a state horse council and why should you form one if your state is lacking one? Well, the American Horse Council published a set of guidelines designed to help with the formation of state horse councils. But first, let's talk about what a state horse council really is. It is an association which actively seeks the participation of individuals and groups from all breeds and all types of horse activities, amateur or professional, throughout the state. Its primary purpose is to further the common interest of horse people and augment the activities of the entire industry. So now you're saying, okay, now I know what it is, but why should I form a state horse council? Well, a key purpose of a state horse council is to be an effective government relations program with both the state legislature and the state agencies, such as the Department of Natural Resources or the State Board of Business Regulations, or the State Department of Agriculture. You want to be the point of knowledge uh, your local regulators will come to when they have questions concerning the horse industry. So a state horse council is also a means of communication for horse groups within the state and work to monitor legislative and administrative decisions which affect the horse industry and seek to promote interest in horse-related activities. So think of a state horse council as like a miniature American horse council. The American horse council, we keep an eye on things happening at the federal government level, but we can't do everything and be everywhere all at once. And that's why it's so important that people at the state level are able to keep an eye on things that are happening closer to home. And also you have a better idea of the factors in your area that are unique to your needs. We've got some great guests today. They are from uh, Maryland and Oregon and Kansas. So you're going to hear about some, you know, unique 
needs that each state has, which kind of tempers the way they go, such as your local government structure or climate or environmental needs. What's needed in Maryland is very different from what might be needed in Oregon. Other differences could be funding, could be zoning, could be recreational access, and there's just a laundry list of things there. I mentioned that the American Horse Council has a guidebook on how to form a state horse council. I'm not going to get into the all details because it's a big book, but I did want to give you an idea of the ideal way to get a state horse council going, and our panelists are going to help with that. So one of the things you need, of course, to have, like any good association would, is a set of complete bylaws that outlines things like membership and how your governance works and guidelines on how things are um, elected or how they run or standing committees, laundry list. You have to be incorporated in your state. You have to be recognized by the IRS. You've got to have a source of income. So there's lots of little nuances to figure out how to form a state horse council. And you don't have to have a paid staff to have a state horse council. Many of the states have part-time or even volunteer staff that work on things. And as I mentioned earlier, not every state has a state horse council. Right now, 26 states in the, in the country have official state horse councils. So if you're in one of those states, please, please support your state horse council. If you're not in one of those states, if you're in those other 24, listen up and let's talk about how you can get one started. A state horse council does more than just get involved in local legislation. So it's a great way to meet new friends in your horse community and act as a horse ambassador to your non-horsey friends. So with that, I am going to introduce our panelists, and we're going to begin by asking each of them to tell us a little bit about their state horse council, a brief overview, and what year they were formed, what kind of things they are involved in, whether they have staff, paid staff or volunteer staff, or those kinds of things. So just somewhere to sort of level set. So let me begin, and we're going to sort of go in in the order that I've got on my notes here so I don't get confused. So Justine Staten's with us. She's from Kansas. Kim Egan is with us from Maryland. And Brandy Ebner is with us from Oregon. So I'm going to ask Justine if she will unmute herself, introduce herself, and tell us a little bit about the Kansas State Horse Council. Thank you, Julie. Well, so I am Justine State, and I'm the executive director of the Kansas Horse Council, and we are organized as a 501c6 to represent businesses as well as individuals in our industry, and we allow some policy advocacy work under a c6. So interestingly, both m much of our membership is comprised of individuals and families with, we have very few businesses and associations or clubs, though we represent and include businesses in our discussions and anything that's apl applicable to them specifically or particularly policy-wise. Awesome. So just for fun, uh, Justine, do you guys have chapters or is the Kansas State Horse Council doing state and local uh, initiatives? So we we cover the state. We don't have chapters. We do state and local initiatives where we do have chapters is we formed a an MOU with our backcountry horsemen of Kansas. And we have chapters for that because, you know, it takes a lot of boots on the ground to do the hands on uh, work that they do for trail maintenance and stewardship. Good for you. I love those backcountry horsemen folks. They're great. <laughs> Kim, unmute yourself and talk a minute about Maryland. Maryland. Thank you, Julie. Maryland's Horse Council was first incorporated in 1985. So we celebrated an anniversary of some sort recently. I'm not good at math. We operate on both the state and local level, which is primarily the county level. But we also will work down to the municipality level when necessary. We have no paid staff. We are all volunteer we have no executive director. We have just our board. And it's a labor of love for almost all of us. We are a small geographic state, but we are very horse dense and our horse industry is very diverse. So we have a committee structure within our board to try to stay as informed as we can on all a whole variety of different sectors. And then we also have a trade magazine that we acquired in, I want to say, 2019 to be our newsletter, I suppose you could say, the hometown newspaper for the horse industry. 
and we have a website and a lot of reader oriented input and stuff, et cetera, from the equiary that also helps us keep abreast of the situation. Oh, you guys are so engaged. I love to come to Maryland. You guys just had a wonderful, what'd you call it? Horse day. <laughs> horse forum. The horse forum. Horse forum. It was it was fantastic. Yeah. So Justine mentioned that they had a partnership with Backcountry Horsemen. I'm just curious, in Maryland, do you have natural allies or strategic partners that you work with? We hear some state councils say, hey, we partnered with the local State Farm Bureau or another group. What happens in Maryland, Kim? We have, well, we, our membership structure is that we have a membership category for associations, which are any member organization that is, you know, per, uh, for example, the Trail Riders of Today, TROT, they are in 501c3 that works on trails issues. We also have associations that are breed specific or discipline specific. All of those organizations are members of the Maryland Horse Council. So that makes our information sharing fairly seamless. We are also very close partners with our commodity board, the Maryland Horse Industry Board, which is part of the Department of Agriculture. It, We, the Horse Council, delegated the part of our mission that was promoting the Horse Council, the horse industry, to MHIB because as an all-volunteer organization, we didn't have the bandwidth to both monitor legislation and promote our massive industry. Our industry is $3 billion for our tiny state. So so they've taken that aspect of it, and we work hand in glove with MHIB on you know regular daily basis. So I would call them our primary partner. But anybody can join. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Brandy, you're up. Talk about Oregon. Yes. Thank you, Julie and Glenn, for having us on. Um, my name is Brandy Ebner. I'm the executive director about, of the Oregon Horse Council. We have a, kind of a unique start. We're probably one of the youngest horse councils. Uh, we were formed in 2009 as a equine-focused tourism program of a chamber of commerce. And so we had a lot of equestrian activities around our chamber and in our community. And so our chamber formed this to kind of focus on those activities and then it expanded and grew. And by 2015, um, it had hit point that we had gone statewide. So we broke off and created our own 501c6 and created our own board, things like that. So we're not very old. We are all volunteer. In the early days, I was a chamber staff member. So I was actually paid to do OHC related work. Since COVID hit, especially, it was hard. So many of our businesses struggled just to stay afloat with all the guidelines that Oregon put in place. So at that time, we went to all volunteer, and that's what I do today. Uh, we do not have chapters. We are a small but mighty group with our board that tries to oversee everything in the state at all times. As far as partnerships go, our business, we're a very business-focused model because we started as a chamber of commerce. So our membership is 97% businesses and clubs, associations, and nonprofits. Uh, we have very, very few individual members. So we work very closely with our backcountry horsemen, as well as a group called Oregon Equestrian Trails. We joke that Oregon Equestrian Trails focuses on the, the like trailheads and the starting parts of the trails and backcountry focuses on the deep parts of the trails. And so they work closely together on trail issues. And of course, um, we align with them on all of the, the issues and supporting when we can in that way. So we're a little bit different than a lot of the councils and we're still pretty young, but we've We've worked hard and are trying to always figure out the path COVID through a loop in us. So we had to really readjust what our focus was. And we, from the business and the individual standpoint, still focus advocacy is probably our number one reason for existing. Wow. So listeners, you've just heard three very different models with very different initiatives and focus areas. So a state horse council doesn't have to follow a little set pattern, generally speaking, Brandy, I'm going to go backwards this time since you're the the most current, the uh, most recently formed of the three that are on here today. What would you say is the one piece of advice to someone out there who says, I'm in one of those 24 states that doesn't have a state horse council and we need one? What should what would you tell them if they wanted to start a state horse council? I would say the biggest piece, in my opinion, is really trying to create a unified voice across all disciplines, breeds, activities, regions of your state. I've heard and talked with people who want to create a horse council for personal agenda reason or an issue that's only in their town. 
and, or they want to create it for like a profit source. And I truly believe that a horse council needs to be a nonprofit and it needs to represent all equestrians in some form. So in my opinion, to start off with, don't just get a couple of friends who are angry about a local issue and start something, but really make sure you're working and hearing from the industry as a whole, regardless whether they agree with you in that standpoint or not. But to be a strong horse council, you need to be open and willing to invite everyone in. And I think that's where we've struggled a little bit is because we started in a specific town with a much English heavy writing discipline. And so it's been a bit harder for us to spread statewide and especially invite in those Western disciplines because they still, I still get people today. It's been, you know, I don't know how many years now, (laughs) a long time. And they'll be like, oh, aren't you in Portland and do like dressage stuff? And I'm like, no, no, we are statewide entity. So I would say just really work on unifying everyone together before you get something launched. Awesome. I I say amen to everything you said. I think having that unified voice is so important. Kim, what would you say is your piece of advice to somebody wanting to start a state horse council? I have two. The first is, it is important, I believe, for the people who are participating in the state horse council to have a strong understanding of what a 501c6 is. So Brandy's organization and mine are both 501c6s, which are business leagues in the eyes of the IRS. And the the obligations of a business league are to advance the interest of a, the common interest of a business. As Brandy alluded, it is not a personal bully pulpit for your particular grievance with your state or county or whatever. It's intended to promote the business interests of the whole industry. And we go through phases of people sort of either losing sight of that or not having realized that to begin with, that we're not a riding club. We are a a legislative advocacy entity. So that's really important to keep in mind. And you're not going to please everybody at all times because the industry's interests are what you're working on behalf of, not, you know, Susie Q's farm operation. So you have to have a little bit of a tip skin. The second tough skin. The second thing is that it's important to have a really good flow funding mechanism, whatever the funding mechanism you have is, it is the priority of your board of directors is to keep the money coming. If the board does nothing else, that's what it has to do. Uh, Even though Brandy's organization and my organization have no paid staff, that doesn't mean you don't need any money to do your lobbying work. We have a few, we have one full-time staff that works on the advertising for the equiary, but we don't have any other full-time paid staff. So funding and having a clear understanding of what a trade association is, I think are critical. Hey, funding, funding is what makes the world go around. (laughs) Justine, answer the same question. But in addition, talk a minute about what does it take to get a state horse council started? I mean, don't to Kim's point, you have to have a little change in your pockets to maybe even get an attorney to help you with bylaws or some of the nuances. But what what should someone be prepared to kind of fundraise in order to just get themselves off the ground. Yeah, I thank you for that question. And and I probably should back up because I really didn't give when we were established or our scope of work. And I think that will kind of sum up because uh, I concur with both what Kim and Brandy said about what is needed and what the focal point should be. But we were started with a, a horseman with foresight who was tasked by our state board of agriculture. So I think having the the support of your state board of agriculture or your department of agriculture behind you is important. And looking at, you know, we, we initiated the limited liability law. We oversaw disease issues when we brought the FEI endurance race to Kansas in 1996. And we had we worked on, we were the first rail bank for Rails to Trails Conservancy, Equestrian Trail. So we, there's a lot of things that as you're looking, what does what does the horse council do? I think there is a misunderstanding in some places that it is just a trail riding group, but you have to look bigger than that. Things that impact the state, the health of the state, the health of the horses. But we realized early on, we were formed in 92, and we realized early on that it takes money to keep things going. So in 96, we launched an equine expo, and that's been kind of our primary sustenance. But then later on, we added royalty license plates to that. And in some places, they've even uh, been able to pass a check off or, you know, a tax incentive to or a tax provision 
to fund for the equine, kind of similar to a horseman's fund for racing, if you want to call it that. Yeah, every state has a little different revenue model. Kim, what are your primary sources of fundraising? We have no revenue stream from the state of the sort that Justine has, much to my chagrin and great jealousy. Our funds come from our membership dues and from advertising in the Equiary, our trade, our trade magazine, and that's it. And then whatever generous sponsors and donors we can drum up. Wow. So if anybody listening wants yeah, to there you write go. us a check, please do. <laughs> Call Kim. Give, give, give. Brandy, what kind of revenue options do you guys do? We are very much in the same boat as Kim. So we get no state funding, grant funding, anything like that. Um, ours also comes from our membership dues. We produce a printed Oregon horse directory. So it's like the yellow pages of the equine industry. I believe we're one of the only states that has a printed directory. So advertising sales definitely play into a huge piece of our income. Man, that thing takes like four months of my life to put together every year though. So if, it, if we cross cancel how much we made on it versus my time, it's a losing proposition, but it is so valuable and expected by our industry. If we eliminated it, I think people would be very upset. So advertising sales with that, our membership. And then we are basically the key producers of technical large animal emergency rescue courses in Oregon. So we bring out Dr. Rebecca Houston twice a year and produce re- these courses for primarily first responders, but we welcome all equestrians and large animal owners. And because we've had some great partnerships with that, we've been able to actually use it as a, a fundraising source because a lot of times we have more attendees um, sign up for the course and what our expenses need. So we actually make money producing those and that helps us keep us going. Okay, so I don't have a horse expo or anything like that in in, under ours. So that is it. Well, so I was going to say I've heard educational content you can sell. I've heard members, I've heard advertising, I've heard sponsorships, and then I've heard special events that, like Justine's example there. So lots of different ways. Check off programs. I know there's a couple of states that that sort of have those. I think there's one state, Justine. You tell me if I'm right. That has some kind of feed coupon program. Does that sound right? Yes, I believe so. And and there's different models that can be established in that and have been tried to be established. It's that is a legislative process to get, you know, anytime you're talking taxes or donation type through the tax system, that's a little bit of a challenge. But yeah, so a feed coupon and it can be anything like retail sales, five cents on every bag of horse feed sold, then gets redirected through the state to the horse council to support the programming. There's been a, I think, a consideration of redirecting, you know, maybe a dollar off of Coggins paperwork back to the horse council to support veterinary programs, kind of just a redirect. So it goes back into the general funds. Not all of those are... I think there's been a lot of attempts to get those, but I think Colorado was really the first state to be successful in getting a feed check off passed. And so it's kind of the, the the golden model, if you will. Yeah, got it. Well, you know, I'm thinking I'm going to, I've got a bunch of questions to ask because I you keep generating more ideas in my head. Talk to me a minute about, because I'm going to let Justine do a little, a uh, shameless plug here, at resources available to help new councils. So Justine is the chair of the Coalition of State Horse Councils. So all those that are mem- that ha- are members of the American Horse Council and our state horse councils get a seat on the coalition. And the coalition does routinely educational content and all kinds of things. So talk a minute, Justine, about how the coalition of state horse councils can help new groups as they begin to kind of get their legs under them. Absolutely. I I really feel like just the the conversations that we have with one another is a key. And then, you know, looking for grant resources available, you might glean some information out of those discussions. Sometimes there are grants through your state, whether it's uh, your commerce department or your ag department that can support programs that that will build your uh, your council. And there are also goodness. Well, the the UHC has programs that even one component of your council, it becomes a resource directory, so to speak, uh, for for the welfare segment. If you you develop your council and you have your different 
pillars of focus, then you can, within those pillars, find those resources that directly impact that. And and a lot of that comes from just networking with the other state horse councils to see what's going on. And maybe you have to develop that in your state. Uh Uh-huh. So one of the things that the American Horse Council does at the federal level is we host a legislature fly-in. So people come to Washington, D.C. When we go up into congressional offices, we make our case. We talk about the importance of our industry so that we can build allies with people up on the Capitol Hill. And my question for, start with Brandy, is do you host a state legislature day in Oregon where you mobilize people and you go up to the state capitol? We have not. We have definitely talked about it. I guess we've been lucky. We haven't had too many things hit the state legislator programs that have been really detrimental to the horse industry. So we haven't had that, I guess, that kind of thing to rally everyone. Unfortunately, I think a lot of folks here are just like pleasant with like, well, I go out and ride my horse and I don't have to really think about any of that legal stuff. And so we're constantly trying to get folks to realize that if we don't pay attention and we don't put our two cents in, we will be forgotten. We also partner with some other entities. So we really support and work with the Oregon Fair Association because fairgrounds are so crucial to our equestrian industry for everything from, you know, places where our 4-H and FFA kids get to ride, um, but also so many of our equestrian events and whether that be, you know, clinics or rodeos or banquets happen at fairgrounds. So we do support and work with the Oregon Fair Association on their legislative day. And then we kind of take advantage of any other groups that kind of make sense um, on their legislative days to also, you know, show face and and get that time. We haven't had a formal one ourselves yet. Gotcha. Kim, do you guys do a day? We we do. We do a horse industry day in Annapolis at some point during the legislative session. We didn't during COVID, of course. And there's been, you know, we don't. There are, there are years when we don't do one, but in general, we do one every year. We partner with a bunch of our organizations like Maryland Horse Industry Board, the Commodity Board, the Racing Industry, a few other big equine businesses, et cetera. And we have one year we did a, a great cocktail party. It happened to be th- Valentine's Day. We had a catered cocktail party and everybody, you know, 200 legislators came through and had a good time with us. Sometimes we set up in the halls of one of the legislative buildings. This last year, we were outside on the steps of Lawyers Mall because there was a lot of construction going on inside the buildings. And we all bring our material and we hobnob with our legislators. You know, one of the great things about being the Maryland Horse Council is Maryland is not a very big state and each other. I mean, it's it's not like you're going to see faceless legislators. These are our neighbors. These are our fellow business people. We we run into them in all walks of life. So it's it's very it's very old fashioned and collegial. And so it's the horse industry day is actually a lot of fun. It's not an adversarial picketing type thing. It's just all of us getting together to work about, through our common problems. It's great. Yeah, I love to hear the word collegial when when we're talking <laughs> politics. That's amazing. Yeah. Hey, there Justine, so talk to, talk a minute about whether you guys do up something up on the Capitol. Well, yeah, so there's a couple different things that we do. Uh, we have the Sunflower Trails Day where we all, in January, all the different trail user groups come to the Capitol and we meet and greet with the representatives there. We have kind of stations of information and displays. And, you know, I absolutely look for the opportunities to engage, whether it's by email conversation or, or otherwise, just to continue that conversation once we've made that connection. And then of course, I absolutely love coming to DC and doing the fly in because there's, it just kind of brings it from one place to another and then back again. So, yeah. And we we so appreciate when you guys come to D.C. and help us because you going into a congressional office for someone from Kansas is so much more impactful than me going in there who lives in the District of Columbia area and trying to talk to them about it. They really resonate when they get to see someone who's a constituent uh, of theirs. So I guess I should have mentioned that we also have our governor's ag summit annually and we have a, a an equine sector session those are some great opportunities to be in front of your state representatives and stakeholders across the ag sector particularly and 
And it really is a networking. It's it's another networking conference, so to speak. It's typically a, a day long with a, a mixer on one side or the other. Plus, our sector session is a breakout. And it's a way for us here in Kansas to highlight industry issues and bring in speakers to, to you know, ex- subject matter experts to share from outside of the state for consideration. And then, of course, the Ag Summit is where all the different ag sectors come together. And it's just a, a good opportunity, again, to look at what is somebody else doing. I always tell Kansas Corn that they are they're the bomb when it comes to marketing. I want to be like them when I grow up, you know, to, to know what you'll learn from somebody else in the room. That's definitely, that's definitely the case. Okay. So we're going to start to wrap up here. Here's my last question for the panel for today. So we all have so much going on, whether it's at the local, the state or the federal level, but I'd love to know. So I'm going to start with Brandy again. Is there any particular issues happening in your state that you're working on that you think listeners would benefit by knowing about? Yeah, I mean, we're always working on trail issues, like I said, with our partners with CCHO and and OET, just making sure that equestrian trails remain. They aren't taken away from us and that the correct user groups are on the correct trails. So that's kind of an ongoing issue that I think every state has. Uh, The biggest concern we have in Oregon is there is a a man in Portland who is trying, this will be his third attempt to get a ballot initiative. It's IP 28 at this point in Oregon. And basically his goal is to make it illegal to utilize animals for any reason whatsoever. So this would make it illegal and even to a point of jail time and fines for people who do artificial insemination, who train or ride animals in any way, any kind of humane animal husbandry practices would become illegal, as well as things like even if you had a mouse in your house, you wouldn't be allowed to kill it. It's it's extreme. It's to an extreme level. No animal could be eaten in Oregon that's raised in Oregon. So you wouldn't have market steers and, and dairy products and things anymore. So it's, it's pretty out there. And I think folks can easily dismiss that something that severe could ever happen. The problem is because he's going on a ballot measure, it only takes 112 signatures to get on a ballot in 2026. And he is pushing it as, do you want to stop animal abuse? So people aren't seeing any further than that. They're just like, oh my gosh, yes, I want to sign on. I don't believe in animal abuse, which obviously we all agree with that, but they're not reading deeper into what it means. And so there is constant concern in Oregon. I know something similar was attempted in Colorado. This man has made it a life goal and he will not end until he either dies or gets this through in Oregon as well as other states. And he is trying to rally folks to do the same initiative in other states across the country um, until he can end all basically animal usage. So it is always on our radar. We have a very kind of unofficial coalition with all the other agricultural and livestock groups in the state. And we meet regularly just to kind of discuss where he's at, where is his funding coming from. And unfortunately, the the man has been able to get six figures in, in funding donations. And when money starts playing in, it doesn't take long to be able to pay people to go get those signatures and such. And it's going to hit the ballot. It will cost millions for us to fight it if it gets on the ballot. So it's it's really scary for us. And we could easily see this take across the country if he gets anywhere in Oregon. So it's probably our number one concern we've always got our eye on here. Wow. Wow. That, that, that for me, Brandy, that's frightening. That's just really frightening. It's incredibly frightening. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Kim, what, what big things are Maryland facing right now? The big issue we work on year in and year out is the shared use of public land here in Maryland. We have a, a large, well, something like half of all ag land is in horse farms Horses are the largest category of livestock in the state, and we have large horse operations on state land, on county land. We have the Assateague Ponies, National Seashore, and we have extensive system of equestrian trails on all of our parks. And so a lot of our work is making sure that horse activities continue to have the same uh, access as other user groups on these properties that horse operations i'm t- thinking of places like fair hill which has the five-star three-day event or washington international horse center which has or the pg county horse center which has washington international horse show both of which are state-owned county-owned government-owned 
you know, stay in good horse use or that, for example, we supported legislation successfully to make sure that access to trailheads was not impeded by farmers who lease state land around the parks, stuff like that. That's always a, an issue. Part of that is also the sharing resources between hunters and riders. Maryland has a pretty lengthy deer hunting season that takes place on the same trails that our horse riders use. So that's always a balancing act there. The rest of our issues most frequently are basic business pocketbook issues, tax issues. We had a strange situation last year where for some reason, some legislator put in a bill that would tax indoor arenas at twice the rate as other ag uses. We never could figure out which legislator did that. Nobody admitted to it. Everyone said, oh, that wasn't us. Anyway, we obviously got that taken out. There's a value-added ag assessment bill that keeps coming up about whether there should be a different comparable, different assessment rate for value-added ag, which includes equines or not. There are any number of other financial issues. There was a bill last year that would have taxed all services, including farriers, riding instructors, et cetera. We basically play defense on those pocketbook issues. And that's what takes up a lot of our time. And the rest of our legislative work is relationship building, to be honest. I mean, I, I'm a practicing lawyer as well. And I always have the have always had the position that if if some if it gets as far as a trial or to a hearing on a piece of legislation, then you haven't done your job well. Because you <laughs> if you're good at it, you can head all that off long before it gets to a public forum. Well, I think you guys have heard me say at the American Horse Council conference, you you don't wait till you have an issue to make a friend in, in, up at the Capitol. Exactly. <laughs> you build you build those relationships early and often. Yeah. Right. And anymore, the legislator contacts us, not the other way around and say, hey, this thing is coming up. Mm-hmm. Have you heard of it? Do you know? What do you think about it? And that's that's much more how we prefer to operate. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Indeed. OK, so Justine, round us out. Tell us what's going on in Kansas. Any big th- State issues? Well, I would say I would concur with the property tax piece. That's kind of, I think, everywhere. And that's what I'm hearing folks say is that their county assessors have raised their rates. And now they're considering what used to be a, a working facility now is considered recreational, giving them the, you know, so there's there's little battles like that that continuously go on. I would say also that we're always watching what's happening around us. Thankfully, we're not an in, initiative and referendum state like Oregon and Colorado are. So that keeps some of the the crazy petitions for putting something on a ballot at bay for us, but doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities. So I always uh, suggest and recommend that folks keep their eye on what's happening in, in, in other states. Um, like, you know, we, we keep up with PRCA because what's happening in L.A. and Alameda County can easily come somewhere else where there's a passionate minority group of PETA activists that may want to to ban rodeo and rodeo is huge in our state. And just like carriage, the carriage issues, I, I even reached down to Texas because a huge carriage operator in Dallas does a lot for us and with us here in Kansas. And so, you know, I'm going to support him any way I can. So it t- sometimes what we do goes beyond our state border, but I'm always paying attention around and watching what's happening. I'm super excited about our current issue initiative, I guess you would call it, is getting racing back in our state. We haven't had horse racing since about 2000 and between seven and 10, depending on which track you're talking about. And um, it's taken a while to to get funding back into the Horseman's Fund. And so right now it's under a proviso and I'm eager to see that get codified in 2025 so that it's in in perpetuity now that we have the historical horse racing machines that will begin in 25 to start funding that program again. And and that, of course, is going to bring other issues. You know, it's going to we're trying to grow the the breeders back in the state, recruit them back in the state and course, racing in itself has other other things that you have to to be attentive to and um, any concerns for welfare. We need to, to to be prepared for that. And also putting putting enough staffing in place with our, our equine practitioners that can provide that level of athletic service needs. And, you know, I think we've all talked across 
the nation that there's an equine veterinary shortage. So what can we do to foster the programs that will grow the service providers that we need? So we're really kind of looking at kind of a big picture, but at, at you know, on the microscopic level, we're really trying to get it started. So. Well, I want to thank our panel for a great discussion. Hopefully listeners have found a tidbit of information to get them excited about forming a state horse council, getting involved in their state horse council, volunteering for your state horse council, contributing to your state horse council, and and just being part of the solution for grassroots advocacy. We, I mentioned we have a book on how to form a state horse council. We also have a second book, which is on ideas and suggestions to help identify ways to sustain or grow your state horse council. So listeners, if you need resources, reach out to us at the American Horse Council or contact one of these folks you heard today. I'll have their contact information in the show notes when we post the podcast so you can contact them directly and pick their brains. And we really just want to thank the panel for making themselves available and sharing their their personal experiences and and those of their state horse council. So thank you so much. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. This legislative update segment is brought to you by Absorbean. At Absorbean, we know that time you spend with your horses, whether in the barn or in the saddle, is truly rewarding. So we've developed a line of high quality and innovative horse care products that help ensure that your horses look, feel, and perform their best. Since 1892, our passion and commitment has led to Absorbean becoming the horse world's most trusted name. Absorbean is recognized as a worldwide leader in specialized animals animal health care products, including Absorbean's Veterinary Liniment, um, Ultra Shield, Show Sheen, Silver Honey, Hoof Flex, and many, many more. Whether it's helping soothe a muscle or a joint pain or protecting your horse from biting and uh, nuisance flies or caring for their hooves or helping them look like a champion, Absorbean is dedicated to horse care. So for more information, visit Absorbean.com. So for this episode, since we've been talking about things that happen at the state and local level, where the largest population of horse enthusiasts are involved in recreational trail riding, I decided to focus on the BOLT Act. And BOLT stands for Biking on Long Distance Trails. We've been working very closely at the American Horse Council with the Backcountry Horsemen of America. The BOLT Act is included in the Explore Act, which has passed the House. And it was recently scored by CBO, which is the organization in the federal government that looks at these bills. And H.R. 1319 would direct the Department of Agriculture and the Interior within 18 months of enactment to identify at least 10 existing bicycle trails on federal land that are at least 80 miles long and 10 more potential such trails that can be developed. The bill would allow the agencies to distribute maps, install signs, and issue promotional materials highlighting those trails. It would also be required to invite public comment on the proposed trails and publish a summary of those comments within two years of enactment. And that last part is really important to the horse riders because of multi-use trails and sharing the trails with other partners like bicyclists and hikists and those kinds of things. And so one of the provisions that's included in this is called conflict avoidance with other uses. So before identifying a long distance bike trail under this The secretary is concerned, shall ensure that the bike trail minimizes conflict with the uses before the date of enactment of this and avoids any trail or road that is being part of a long distance bike trail and that multi-use areas where biking, hiking, horseback riding and the use of pack and saddle stock our existing users on the date of this. So pay close attention and we'll keep you apprised as to how this comes about and how you can get engaged. So if a trail near you gets identified to be considered for biking, then we have an opportunity to provide comments. So thank you for joining us today. I'm sorry you've been stuck with just little old me for this whole episode. Emily will be back with us next month. We will provide all kinds of information and links in our show notes. We invite you to support our beloved industry and join the American Horse Council or your state horse council and earn a free subscription to our newsletter, 
where you can keep uh, abreast of the latest in all the legislative happenings, both federal and state, as well as information that horse owners like you might need to know. Uh, We can follow the American Horse Council on social media. You'll find us on Facebook, Instagram, X, which is formerly Twitter, and LinkedIn. And you can also subscribe to this podcast through an RSS feed. You can subscribe to Horses in the Morning on any podcast player and find all the shows, including ours, on Horse Radio Network at thehorseradionetwork.com. So folks, to wrap up, as we like to say, we are hashtag here for horses. 